After more than 30 years in elective office, Assemblywoman Sandra Gallif has announced she will not run for another term. She says it's not part of what's been called the Great Resignation. She just feels it's time to move on. Maybe not to travel to Albany every Monday and stay at the Holiday Inn Express or whatever, or at whatever hotels I'm in, and uh, to stay home. But I want to do a lot of other things, and I'm not sure what I am going to do. Galef represents the 95th Assembly District. Currently, the district includes the towns of Phillipstown and Kent in Putnam County. She also represents Peekskill, Cortland, including the village of Buchanan, as well as the village of Ossining. But the boundaries for this year's election have not yet been finalized. Galef's decision not to seek another term is setting up a primary in the Democratic Party. One of the candidates for that nomination is the current supervisor here in the town of Ossining, and she has served on Galef's staff. Dana Levenberg was Galef's communications director and then chief of staff before her election as supervisor. She really reached out to all her constituencies and made sure that people felt like they were heard. In the primary race, Levenberg is facing former Peekskill Councilwoman Vanessa Agodello, as well as Westchester County legislator Colin Smith. Galef has endorsed Levenberg, but the others say they are not deterred by that. Yes, it has a, a, an impact, a positive impact for, for Dana's campaign, um, but uh, it, it doesn't uh, dissuade us in the least from moving forward and uh, feeling that we will be uh, successful at the end of the day. I do think that um, it's going to be the one-on-one -on -one conversations with uh, with voters. Um, it's going to be ensuring that uh, the communities feel as though their issues are being voiced. But with the Republicans eyeing a chance to claim the seat Galef is vacating, the winner of the Democratic primary is not assured of a smooth ride to victory in November. In Austin, I'm John Goff. As he played We Shall Overcome, the anthem of the civil rights movement, 80-year-old Earl Acosta reflected on the event, an African-American taking the oath of office as President of the United States. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. You're a great man. You got a great family. You make you be glad to go on around about this time to see what's going on now. Earl lives in Mamaroneck. He's a resident at the Jewish Home Life Care Sarah Newman Center. But those values upon which our success... Residents at the nursing home gathered together to watch Barack Obama's inauguration. Among them, 89-year-old Louise Bryant, a native of Maryland. She, too, has witnessed the struggles of African Americans. And so the election of the senator from Illinois as president has a special meaning for her. I lived through, naturally, Dr. King's civil rights work. And uh, to, to, to see, it, see it almost accomplished. The west side of the Capitol is at the other end of the mall, from the Lincoln Memorial where King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech in 1963. But for Earl and Louise, the distance the nation has traveled is immense. But I got a lot of grandkids and I'm glad they'd be able to see it. But, uh, but for them to see a thing like this, and I never thought I would be here to see it. And while not everything has yet been overcome, we are getting closer. In Mamaroneck, John Goff, News 12. The tension surrounding almost everything that happened was beyond belief. It's been 50 years since Dr. Joseph English was working as the first chief psychiatrist for the Peace Corps. On November 22, 1963, he was at the Peace Corps' headquarters in Washington with his boss, the president's brother-in-law and the president's sister, Sergeant and Eunice Shriver. The motorcade moves into the downtown area. Then the news arrived, which changed everything. A shocked nation weeps. The uh, press officer passed us a message that it was a headshot. And then, of course, the next message was that the president had died. From that point on, Dr. English's weekend was spent helping work out the details of the state funeral for the fallen president. He was also involved in the decision to keep John Kennedy's casket closed. Dr. English and then Defense Secretary Robert McNamara were dispatched to the East Room of the White House to see if it could be an open casket, considering the massive head wounds Kennedy had suffered. We went in and they opened the casket. Of course, you could see 
what that shell had done uh, to the back of, the, of Mr. Kennedy's head. Dr. English also worked with McNamara to organize the military participation in the funeral. In the face of some resistance from a general, McNamara gave this order. If it takes 50 troops, they'll be there. If it takes 500, they'll be there. If it takes 50,000 and we need to mobilize the reserves, start it immediately. And then on Monday, November 25th, he was asked to walk with world leaders from the White House to the church for President Kennedy's funeral mass. Right there. He was there to provide medical assistance, especially for Ethiopian Emperor Haile Selassie. The emperor was not well, and they were afraid that he might not make it. I asked Dr. English 50 years later, what is the lasting effect of that weekend on all of us? I think we understood in a new way the fragility of life and that we never know how long or short it's going to be. It all began on a playground on Manhattan's west side. Martin and Beatrice Sasson met when they were both in their early teens. They started out playing handball together in the playground and have now been married 71 years. He lived on the one street and somehow we ended up coming, we both played handball. So that's where we ended up meeting and playing him all lot. She's fantastic. <laughs> my right hand, my secretary, my cook, my chief. She's right there when I need her. During World War II, Beatrice and Martin were separated for six years while he served in the Army. When I came back, she was still waiting for me. And that was it since then. And on February 16, 1946, they were married at Sacred Heart Church in Yonkers. You have to try and understand each other's ways, each other's habits, each other's way of doing things. Their marriage has produced four children, 10 grandchildren, along with 16 great-grandchildren. And in an age when some marriages end before the thank you notes for wedding gifts can be mailed out, Martin, who is 92, and Beatrice, who is 91, say there's one key ingredient which has kept their union strong all these years. And we kiss goodnight every night. No matter how angry or how discouraged you may be, there's always tomorrow. And that's probably good advice to anyone who wants to have a relationship that lasts. In Stony Point, John Goff, News 12.